good afternoon i started my work life way back in 1976 and uh, joined the indian it industry in 1981 after working for a few years for a company that closed down in 1985 me and a uh, couple of senior colleagues uh, we decided that we should start a company our own At that time i was 28 years old so this is uh, 1985 india it industry is just about starting so you go to a bank a bank owned by the state and wanted to open an account not ask for a loan but wanted to open an account to the bank and the bank said no you cannot open an account with us unless you are introduced by somebody who is already doing business with us she so went to another bank and this happened to be the american express bank and they said okay we will let you open an account with the condition that you will have a minimum amount of deposit and you will never ever ask us for a loan so on that condition the bank account was open the company closed down after exactly 3 years because we were doing good business they were paying customers but we couldn't get working capital loan from anybody so in um, 1988 i came back to work for a company and uh, exactly after 10 years in 1999 uh, again the entrepreneurship bug uh, bit me and uh, this time venture capital industry was there and the venture capital industry was cross border so we raised 9.5 million from an american venture capitalist and an indian venture capitalist and a second round raised another 15 million so in all about 24 25 million 24 plus million and started a company called mindtree which is one of the most respected it uh, services companies in india today but that company which started with uh, venture capital fund because somebody trusted me trusted us today is a nearly 800 million dollar company uh, in terms of revenues has been listed in the indian exchanges for the last 10 years and uh, employs 16000 people worldwide the unique identification uh, number in india is called the eyd number or the aadhar number that engine was actually built by mindtree i'm telling you the two narratives because in the first case where a company closed down is because the bank didn't trust us and in the second case a great institution got built because somebody trusted us no collateral just simple trust and gave the money after running that company for uh, exactly 18 years uh, 19 months back i was called by one of the 29 states in uh, india called odisha to help the government full time with skill development for high school dropouts and middle school dropouts my state's name is odisha i was born in that state it has a population of about 42 million people it's the ninth in terms of area and 11th in terms of population and as chairman of odisha skill development authority my charter is to create employable skills for people who drop off the educational system after the fifth eighth and 10th class and they will never ever go back to the educational system this year and the coming year i have a target of providing employable skill development to the bottom of the pyramid these children for the approximate number of about 630000 young people 80% of them will go through a short term skill development program and 20% will go to a tvet equivalent in singapore that is provided by ite so while looking at this uh, big number of 630000 people to be skilled one of the challenges that i face is that skill development is all very fine but it invariably brings displacement people who get an employable skill will have to leave their home and hearth and go far away from where they were born where their families are and work in a large un- unfriendly city and not for everybody there's a job so as i looked into it 19 months back 
I was pleasantly surprised to find that banks are also doing skill development. And mostly these are nationalized banks. So I go to one bank's training center and I find that the bank is doing training for goat rearing for village people. And in the training center, the trainer is sitting on a chair and the trainees brought from different villages are all on their haunches on the floor. And there, uh, some of them have even a baby in their arms. They're getting trained for a week on how to rear goats. And then at the end of it, the bank will give them less than about $500 to buy a goat. In that, uh, as I was interacting with the uh, audience there, with the trainees there, one young mother was holding a baby and uh, at the end of the interaction, I just, in, in, you know, the grandfather in me kicked in, so I said, can I hold your baby? And she gave me her baby. And the uh, neighbor uh, who was standing right next to her said, sir, please take the baby away. So I was kind of surprised. And I said, what do you mean by that? So to that, she replied that she has lost her husband, and at least with you, the baby will grow up better. It was a defining moment for me. Here's a bank who is trying to teach her how to rear a goat and then with a small amount of loan that she will get from the bank and hopefully re recover her life. And uh, here her neighbor is saying you can take the baby away because uh, with you the baby will be in better shape. Then I turned to the banker and said how has been your track record of disbursing loans and to that the banker was nonplussed. A bank's that particular bank had not given any loan, even despite training people. My next moment of truth came to another training center where yet another bank was doing training. And at the end of it, I said, how much money have you disbursed last year to sewing machine operators who are getting trained there? And to that, the banker looked uh, shocked and said, there's a very high risk in lending money to these people because they invariably become non-performing assets. I went to a third center, and this is where the turning point happened, where somebody presented to me a young person with a polio-afflicted leg, and he had gone through a skill training program in a Tibet institution, and at the end of it, with his own money, about seven or eight hundred dollars equivalent of Singapore money, he had started a tailoring shop. But here it is, in this god second tiny little place, the man not only had started a tailoring shop, but he had created employment for two people. But this happened to be by the roadside where he had put up a small temporary shack where he was doing his work, and uh, the road widening authorities came and said, we'll have to widen the road, and this is an illegal uh, enterprise, so we'll have to remove this. And they shifted him out. And with that went his lifetime savings of approximately seven or eight hundred dollars equivalent in Indian money. They demolished his place and he became an entrepreneur, went and took his business to his little one room uh, housing where he regained his life. But the sad part is that tiny place lost two jobs because he was earlier employing two people in his tiny little business. Now, at that moment of truth, I realized that this man is what I would call a nano-unicorn. In our world, we talk about unicorns. We're all obsessed with unicorns. And unicorns, as all of us know, are internet entrepreneurs with a valuation of $1 billion. But what the world really requires are nano-unicorns. Nano-unicorns like this one who just lost his business. And what is a nano-unicorn? A nano-unicorn is an individual who has the capacity to build a business where in 12 to 18 months' time will be able to employ maybe one and a half, maybe two people. But the system does not trust this individual. So when I started my first failed enterprise, there was lack of trust. When I did my second enterprise, there's a huge amount of trust with which today so much of uh, wealth has got created. But in this case, again, if you look at the world of the nano entrepreneur, the biggest issue is trust. So what we have done is now we are telling skilled individuals to come forward and give us a one-page statement of dream. So anybody who has gone through a skill development program of the state has to come up with a one-page statement of dream. 
And based on this one-page statement of dream, what we do is, it's, it's a little like an MBA uh, case study competition. So these people then face a, uh, a committee that questions them and tests out their self-confidence. And at the end of it, if the committee is convinced that this person is an entrepreneur material, what we do is send this individual for a one-week MBA program where the idea of business is taught by not professors, not by senior government officials, but by small entrepreneurs who have done good in their own small way. At the end of that one week intensive MBA program, what we do is uh, we let the individual recast the dream sheet in terms of whatever inputs the individual might have raised, uh, might have picked up. And at the end of that, we give a check for a hundred thousand rupees. This hundred thousand rupees check gets this individual started, and then we track this individual through the narrative capturing process so that the knowledge of enterprise building is captured throughout the lifetime of this individual. And more than capturing the narrative, we try to get them into a community so that they start exchanging notes and thoughts within themselves and they start depending on their own network. So there's a narrative and there's a community. If this young individual is able to return that money, 100,000 rupees after one year, then the individual pays 0% interest. With that money, we then start funding yet another individual. But this is not a government program. The government provides the platform. What we have done is that the first experiment has gotten started with philanthropic capital of roughly about $250,000. And with that, will this year create 100 narratives, which hopefully next year will go to 1,000, and the year after will create 10,000 narratives. Now, the whole issue is to be able to create a nano unicorn. In a country like India, there are 245,000, I'm sorry I got into lakhs and crores, 245,000 millennials, and there are 47 million school dropouts. But this is not just an Indian, India story. I'm sure this story reverberates in other parts of the world as well. So how can we connect the bottom of the pyramid with the top of the pyramid? How can we create philanthropic capital in a way that we are able to build nano entrepreneurs and through that create true jobs in the larger economy. Now, we have a long way to go, but I believe standing where I am today, there are five major points that come to my mind which I want to share with you today. First and foremost, fintech can create trust. And when we trust somebody, it goes a long way. In my first failed enterprise, the system didn't trust me because somebody trusted me with the venture capital money, no collateral, no difficult questions asked beyond the business plan defense. I was able to build a substantive uh, enterprise. So FinTech can provide trust and with that trust, the world will go a long way. Second thing, as you can see with my nano uh, unicorn idea, FinTech can democratize money. Today, money is still not democratized. Money is with people who can afford to have money. But the magical things can happen when my young skilled trainee, whose baby I was holding, if she has access to money, it changes many things in the world. So FinTech, my second point, can democratize money. The third thing, and this is where it gets interesting, Fintech can make good money borderless. We are spending way too much time tracking bad money across borders. The time has come where we are able to provide access to capital for nano entrepreneurs, nano unicorns, because that is where the true benefit will occur to the world. The third important point is I believe that money will grow faster if it is in more hands. Today, if we just look at unicorns, we look at billions of dollars of valuation, we look at cashing out 
after IPOs, we look at the tons of money, the billions and trillions of dollars of money that the world actually successfully generates that remain in very small hands, very few hands. And when that happens, actually money doesn't grow as much to its potential. So I believe that money will grow even faster if it is in more hands. If money is there in more hands, more people will spend money and with that a very uh, upward uh, uh, positive spiral of money will get created. The fourth thing that I believe is very important and will happen is that fintech can create an entrepreneurial rev uh, uh, revolution by creating the narrow unicorns. And last but not the least, fintech can create memory and community and narrative. At the end of the, end of the day, money is a dumb thing. Money does not have memory by itself and money does not create narratives by itself. But today for the first time, with financial technology, by creating inclusion, we'll be able to build memory into the money and capture the narrative that subsequently uh, get created because technology and money and trust all can come together. Thank you very much for listening to me today. Thank you.